Hi, I'm Susan Engel. I know you already were introduced to me, but it's, it's the strangest introduction I've ever gotten because I had no idea what he told you about me, or if it's true or if it's not true. Anyway, thank you very much for coming to hear me tonight, and uh, I'm very honored to be part of your back to school night. Um, I was telling the parents of the older students, I've been in school my whole life. I love school more than anybody could possibly love it. I love it so much that I found a way to work at one my whole grown up life, and I not only work in colleges, uh, at a college, Williams, but I work in elementary and high schools all the time because that's I, what I like to study. So I, I love September, and I love going back to school, and I'm glad to be here with you at your back to school at night. Um, and I'm going to talk to you for a little while tonight uh, about probably the most fundamental question we have. Uh, well, you may have a different fundamental question, which is, will you ever not be tired? And the answer is yes, when your kids graduate from college, like mine have. Uh, but the other fundamental question that, that brings you here and that brought you to the school, I imagine, is what we want for our children. And actually, I mean two things by that. I, I stumbled over how to title this because there's a, often a disconnect, especially in a community that's lucky enough to have a good private school uh, and good jobs and all kinds of hopes for their kids between what we want for all children and what you want for your child. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little about that because it comes into play into some of the comments um, I'm going to make. But before I go any further, I'm going to tell you a story. So my kid, I have three sons and they're all grown, but um, luckily I get to spend time in the summer with my little nieces and nephews who are you know, 14, 11, and 8. And I was on the beach with my nephew Charlie, who you see in midair there, and um, he had found this log lying down the beach on its side, and he had spent hours trying to figure out how to get it over to where we were lying, and then he had spent quite a, we actually took him several days to do the whole thing. Then he had figured out how to dig a hole and get it in so it was steady enough, and then he had figured out how to get on top of it and make several kinds of leaps about it. And he kept calling me over. Uh, my family calls me Shoe. You must be the first audience I've ever told that to. And he kept saying, Shoe, Shoe, come over, take a look, come on, over. And finally he called me over and he said, I had an idea, now I'm going to fulfill it. <laughs> well, that absorbed me for the rest of August. I thought, oh my God, that's the goal of education. Every kid should have the opportunity and the sort of um, guidance to have an idea, and have is the wrong verb, build an idea, and then figure out how to fulfill it. And I want to talk about that in a, a variety of ways, but I need to go backwards a little bit, uh, because that, that's sort of the end of my story, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the beginning of the story. So when your kids are little, you think about, especially when they're really little, you think about what you want for them. And my guess is you think about things like whether they'll lead happy lives, or whether they'll find someone they love, or whether they'll find something they're good at and enjoy it. And in fact, when we did, when my students and I did a survey about what parents hope for their children, when we asked the parents of younger children, in fact, that's what they said. The single most common answer was, I want my child to be happy, and I want her to be happy when she grows up. Um, but they had all kinds of ways of saying that. I want her to be happy, I want her to enjoy life, I want her to do things she cares about. We also surveyed the parents of older children, and they slowly, the older they get, the kids got, the narrower and tighter the answers got. And uh, captured perfectly by one of the survey respondents who answered the whole page of questions about aspirations and hopes with two words, med school. Uh, and it's funny, but it's also heartbreaking. Um, so I, I don't know if this is the next slide or not, so I have to check and make sure I'm not ruining my story. Yeah, I'd be ruining my story. Um, so I'm going to tell you now, I ended up writing a book called The End of the Rainbow, uh, How Educating for Happiness, Not Money, Would Transform Our Schools. The reason I wrote that book is I had come to realize that money had 
gotten a stranglehold over the way we think about education as educators, as policymakers, as teachers, and yes, as parents. And most of us don't know that. We don't think, oh yeah, all I care about is whether my kid gets rich. Or for people who don't have a lot of money, uh, which is a different population, all I care about. There it's a slightly different equation, which was what I was referring to before. You do feel that if your kid can't earn a decent living, and have a home and steady source of food and some decent job that has dignity and interest, there's no way for them to be happy in other ways. There's no question about that. Uh, but for a population like this, you're not, you don't think that's what you care about most, that your kid gets rich. Uh, and yet, the way in which we, what we look for in our schools, the way in which we measure our children's success, the things that bother us often are driven by a sense that school is leading steadily towards a path that will that includes or ends with great wealth there. Uh, and you know that guy. Uh, and it's a joke, except for the way in which it's shaped our educational system. How did I come to think this? Years ago, when I began to realize the way in which testing, various kinds of testing, but particularly now I'm thinking about standardized tests and statewide tests, were killing the school system killing, not only making schools sort of miserable for children, but failing to teach them the things that really might matter, but also making schools a place where good teachers wouldn't want to teach. So I teach teachers at Williams in addition to teaching psychology, and it becomes harder and harder to encourage my best students to go into public school teaching. Um, because uh, why would you go into a school as a really well-educated, really bright, really lively, energetic person who loves to be with kids, only to be told that your whole day has to revolve around what kind of score kids are going to get on a test. So I realized that testing was having this sort of, casting this pall over the educational system. And I thought, wait a minute, before I criticize standardized testing so much, I better find out whether it works in some way. So maybe it's not being, maybe it's not fun for kids, but maybe those tests either lead to a better education, and the answer is no, they don't, and there's great deal of data that shows that. Uh, or maybe the score you get on a test predicts something really important about your adult life. Maybe it captures something that actually really does matter. And if it does, then, then okay. If it does, it's not that pleasant. It's worth something. Only it turns out if you look at over something like 250 studies about what standardized tests predict, they predict virtually nothing that, that matters. What they predict is what other good test scores you'll get. And that's not surprising at all. So you get a good test score when you're in third grade, big cheese. You're going to get a good test score when you're in, uh, you know, a senior in high school. It's not a very meaningful measure, and it certainly doesn't measure anything about your adult life, about whether you'll find meaningful work, whether you'll have good relationships, whether you'll be a reader, whether you'll know how to get into an argument and change your mind, whether you'll make thoughtful decisions when you vote. It doesn't tell. It doesn't predict much of that. It may cause some of that, because if you get a good test score, you get entree into good places. So it may be a passport of sorts, a first-class ticket, but it doesn't actually in and of itself predict anything. And this obsession with money as the end point of education has led, in my view, uh, to all kinds of bad things in school. So the kids are doing more and more of things that are not good for them and don't lead to a well-educated person, all in order to get them the scores that will enable them to get money when they grow up. As I said, this story, there's another version of this story for children who are not privileged. It's, e it's equally terrible for them. So, Going to school, if, you have, if you're from a disenfranchised and impoverished and minority background in this country, going to school is the, is the best thing you can do to have a decent shot at life. There's no question about it. That's just getting into school and going and staying there. What you learn in school is another matter, and that's where I would argue money should not be the goal of education. So what should? Um, I would argue that happiness is the goal of education. That just as the parents of these young children said in our survey, they want their kids to be happy, that can and should be the goal. It should be the thing that we're striving for in schools as teachers, as, as administrators, and as parents. And you may, you probably are too young to remember uh, Jimmy Carter when he was president, and you may, not all of you are too young, but um, you, uh, I'm looking around, I'm old, I know another 
uh, Jimmy Carter person when I see one. Um, <laughs> you may not have voted for him, and your parents may not have voted for him, but there's no question if you've read about him in recent years, he's very sick now, that he has led a deep and meaningful life, and that it has given him great pleasure. There are many others you could pick somebody else to put up there, but he was on my mind as someone who captured the qualities that uh, we now know are constituent of a happy or full life. So what are the characteristics that I think schools should be teaching their children? It turns out that the ability to become immersed in complex and meaningful activities is one of the most essential things that we can offer children and that has very serious and wonderful repercussions in adult life. And, and the reverse is true, too. Uh, no matter how well you do on a test or you know, how much money you make, if you don't have both the opportunity and the inclination to immerse yourself in activities that are not only absorbing, but have meaning, have meaning to you and to others, um, then you, you are unlikely to have a really full and satisfying life. And the chance to do it doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, interestingly, like many of the qualities on this list, and this is particularly relevant for a group of parents of young children, many of these things kids have a natural inclination for, which makes the job of schools way nicer than it currently is. Instead of forcing things in kids that they resist and that you think are good for them and should replace their childish ways, uh, it turns out that the best education builds on their natural proclivities. Not in all cases. Some things, some characteristics of infants and toddlers do need to be shaped. Um, but many of the most essential qualities for a fully educated person are, are there waiting to be cultivated in school. So schools talk a lot, and you may or may not hear, about skills. Um, but skills are kind of narrow uh, uh, way of talking about what we want to cultivate in, in school. And more to the point, psychologically, it's a little off. Because a skill is something you can do when you're required to. And a disposition is something you're inclined to do. And the example, I'll get to it at the end, but I'll say it right now, is reading. Getting, making sure a child can read is one thing, but it's not nearly enough. Yes, it's a, you have to be able to read to do anything more. But that, that's just the beginning. The most important thing is that a child is disposed to read, and disposed to read under various um, circumstances and for various purposes. So throughout, I emphasize the idea of dispositions, which is a way of saying it's not only what a child can do, but what they are likely to do what they call upon as a characteristic or an ability or a competence in various circumstances. Um, but the second thing is to develop a sense of purpose. So it turns out this is one of the key discriminators in adult life, people who feel some purpose in life, some sense of what they're getting up for every day. Um, sometimes that sense of purpose has to do with supporting your family, and sometimes it has to do with making beautiful art or making a difference in your community or excelling at something. But um, a sense of purpose typically it does not remain only financial. And I don't, you may know people like this who have lost their sense of purpose, but they're very rich. Um, and that is not what schools should be aiming to cultivate in, in, in children. Um, and it turns out it's something we can cultivate in schools. Rather than say, we'll teach them the skills they need, the basic academics, and they can develop their sense of purpose elsewhere, well, they are unlikely to under those circumstances. Uh, schools have this incredible opportunity and responsibility to shape these dispositions, and one of them is the sense of purpose. Acquire an eagerness for knowledge and the ability to get it. So I also wrote another book last year called The Hungry Mind, which is about the development of curiosity. And in it, I talk about the avaricious appetite. Avaricious? Voracious, not avaricious. The voracious appetite infants have for knowledge. It defines early development. All, all virtually all, all normally developing children want to know everything all the time. And in fact, it makes them difficult to take care of. Uh, it turns out that by and large, instead of guiding and fostering and encouraging that quality in schools, we squelch it. And there, I, that's a whole other talk and a whole other lecture about the ways in which that happens and what we can do to avoid that. But there's no question that school is a place where that eagerness for knowledge 
can be cultivated. And it's probably the single most important thing you can cultivate because I haven't been to a school in this country and some other countries as well where I didn't see a mission statement that somewhere says lifelong learning. When you look at what's going on in the school to cultivate an appetite for learning, it can be hard to find. One of the things about curiosity is that we tend to be curious about the things we've chosen to be curious about. It's not easy to become curious about someone else's topic. Um, which is why there is more to this than simply giving children a chance once in a while to ask questions. Uh, there, that's important, but it's not all there is. The ability to think about things fully. This, may, I don't know why I bury it in the middle, because it turns out to be probably the one thing that schools can do best. So, what does that mean? Think about things from several perspectives. Think about things counterfactually. What would happen if it had gone this way? Uh, think about things from how, in the way that you think about them. Think about them if I had one more piece of information. Think about them if I had one less piece of information. It turns out that thinking about something fully is a process that takes time. Um, it doesn't happen as an afterthought because you've learned a lot of information or done well on a lot of tests. To think about things fully, you need to have lots of practice and enticement to think about them fully. Um, and young children are at the best age to do that. Uh, they love to do it, but they need to be invited to do it, and it needs to be at the center of the curriculum. I've already said, contribute to one's um, community. This is key. And more and more research is showing that the ability to do for others, to be connected to others, is essential. The people who don't have that feel a sense of emptiness and uh, purposelessness and isolation. Very often, I don't know about here in this school, um, because I'm not very familiar with the school, uh, but most mission statements on most walls where I've ever been, where I've ever visited a school, there's something about the community. When I go into the classrooms and see what's going on to build community, I don't see very much. And often the reason is because people don't know what really it takes to build community amongst children who might be different from one another or come from different kinds of families. And everybody's worried that if they do that, it will take time away from what they think of as a more academic task. Uh, and that, that's just, you know, that's the wrong priorities. Um, to go along with that, appreciate and understand those who are different from you. Again, that cannot happen in two minutes at morning meeting or in a comment as you're going down to the bathroom. It's worthy of time, of creative uh, curriculum building, um, and of the expertise of teachers. Um, it's not something most teachers are taught when they're learning how to be teachers, how to build community, real community, not just behave well in class or raise your hand. That's not community, that's uh, compliance. Um, and finally, I leave this till the end, even though in some ways it could be the, the heart of a good school, the disposition to read for pleasure and information. <coughs> And here I want to say a word about why I use the term disposition. Most schools, and I think this school too, tends to use the word skill. We've dropped the idea of knowledge because everybody knows that specific kinds of knowledge are not, it's not essential that everybody knows a certain piece of knowledge. Uh, and most schools and colleges talk about skills. The problem with skills is they're something you can use when you're asked to use them. Uh, but they're not necessarily something you do use on your own. Uh, reading is a good example. So kids that are well-schooled or grow up in good families or whatever, you know, by, by good I mean privileged and attentive and supportive, um, often can read when they're asked to. But the real question is, do they want to? Do they turn to books uh, for information? Do they turn to books for solace? Do they turn to books as a way of understanding people and places and events that might be very different from they are? And that's what schools could be cultivating, the disposition to read. If you do that, many of the other attributes of good education that you're used to thinking about will, fall, will, will come naturally. They're, they're not hard to come by, those other things. Information about geography or geometry or whatever. Uh, those follow from anybody for anybody who's a reader. So what would a, so let me stop there and just say one more thing. Just so you understand what I'm suggesting, even if you totally reject it, I'm suggesting that if you had a school 
that could do these things very well, who could make sure that almost all children attained some level of these, and I'm going to get to that, you would have a group of very well-educated children. And I, I would go to the mat saying that even if you didn't do anything else but these things, you'd have a group of very well-educated children. Along the way, you'd also have a group of children who were happy and like, more likely to lead happy lives. Um, and I, that's not just an opinion, that's based on a wide array of research about what constitutes a happy life. So this is not something to do after all the work has been done or the tests have been passed. This is a, a model of what a school could do. Probably in a school like this, many of these things are happening, but it's a question of how they're situated and how they're positioned in the day, whether they're given center stage or not, and whether there's room for them because of all the other things that parents may wish their kids are acquiring. So what should be going on in a classroom that does those things, that is seeking those goals? Uh, it's not your usual list of, for a curriculum. So this would be my idea of a good curricular guide. Uh, I should walk into a classroom and I should see students talking. Children would be having conversations, long conversations, complex conversations, conversations with each other, conversations with children of other ages, conversations with adults. They would be long. Uh, they would be, in some cases, rambling. Um, you need to be able to talk without being guided all the time. Uh, and actually, talking is a wonderful thing. You see, I love it. Um, but real conversations where you exchange points of view and you exchange information uh, is the key, actually, to a civilized society. It's what, you know, I talk about this in the book. I always think of, um, I don't know if this is going to be a good reference for you or not, but Winston Churchill and Roosevelt and Stalin talking before the end of World War II. They were talking. They were working something out in a conversation. We see again and again that when people can really talk, uh, good things happen. And talking does not only mean succeeding at convincing the other person of your point of view. It just as often, if not more, means you come away thinking something different than you did in the beginning. It's a true meeting of minds. Doing that in school, that's what kids should be doing. It's not what they do on, it shouldn't be just what they do at recess. It should be what they're doing in class, reading. We want children to read. Probably if I had asked you to raise your hand, everybody would say they want their kid to be a reader. And if you think your kid isn't a reader, you're worried about it. But then there's so much other stuff we're doing in school, there's barely any time to read. The kid who's lying under the table reading all day, I don't know if you have tables here, but if they're lying under the table reading all day, the chances are, at least intellectually, not necessarily interpersonally, chances are they're going to be very well educated without another thing happening to them. Um, there's a great old study done by a guy named uh, Barron in, from Santa Cruz, I believe, about, uh, he looked historically at what great inventors and accomplishers, you know, artists and uh, businessmen and, and intellectuals had in common that could explain their amazing accomplishments over the course of history and in all kinds of places. And he couldn't find anything, was it, that they had, you know, that they went to a certain kind of school or read a certain kind of book or had some certain kind of characteristic. It turns out the one thing they all had in common was significant periods of time out of school. Um, and in my image of that, it's because all those kids got a chance to uh, read. Um, and that led to a good education. Uh, they should be leaning on one another. They should be helping one another. And it needs to be built into the curriculum. You can't be good at interdependence and community if it's not built into your day. And not just an afterthought that you shouldn't push someone or that once in a while you get a star for helping someone, you've got to be interdependent. And there's some wonderful educational models that make interdependence the key factor of, of the school day. Um, you need the chance to investigate. As I said, I'm very interested in the development of curiosity. Curiosity is not something that's just tolerated. It can be cultivated. Having an interest in something, a voracious need to know something, is just the start. Figuring out how to answer the, your question and when your question has or hasn't been answered is the next part, and that can be done in school. But it, you need teachers who themselves know how to investigate um, and who have experienced the pleasures and dangers of open-ended investigation. Um, there's nothing like failing at an experiment to teach you how to do a better investigation next time. And so you need teachers who are good at that and interested in it. The chance to be useful. I talked about purpose. Uh, 
Often in our society, especially among the middle class, there's this such an effort to make these perfect childhoods and to make every good experience and to make it wonderful that we forget that one of the most wonderful experiences a kid can have is the sense of usefulness, that they matter, that they have actually contributed to the world around them or to their parents' lives or their friends' lives. Um, and it has to be genuine. So actually working with others, for others, doing things that matter, um, and again, I, as I said, it has to be real, um, turns out to be a very powerful component of a, a good school experience. Become an expert. Um, I don't know where you guys stand on this, but uh, it's one in our effort to teach children so many things and cover all the topics in the syllabus and on the tests and get ready for Williams or Harvard or Wesleyan or whatever it is, uh, we forget that ex the experience of expertise is uh, very powerful and determinant of later activity. Having the chance to become a true expert, not give a report on something, but be attain true expertise is a very powerful element of early education. And finally, in this one, I'm sure this is not so relevant here. It is in most public schools in this country. The chance to know and be known by an adult who is not in your family is true. And I could give a whole spiel on why in adolescence that's one of the most essential experiences they can have. Uh, and that takes time and it takes doing things that aren't always task oriented. Uh, because knowing someone, as you all know, is a relationship is more than just working on a task together. Uh, for, as I said, it may be less relevant for this population, but it's an essential part of what needs to go on in a school. So finally, um, I told you that I started all this with a concern about standardized tests and the way in which they were hurting our educational system for all kids. Uh, they don't seem to make the school experience better for kids. They certainly make it worse for teachers. Um, and they don't seem to lead to predict anything of any great uh, worth. Many people in this country, and I'm not one of them, argue that we shouldn't have standardized tests, that, that the things that we value in schools can't be measured. I don't agree. I'm a psychologist. We measure unconscious stereotyping, we measure love, we measure the impulse to gamble, we measure all kinds of things. We can measure the things that we think are valuable for kids to attain in school. The ability to have a long conversation, the ability to become immersed deeply in something, um, and the disposition to do it. And if I think that you were handed a short piece I wrote that's also in my book about how to measure these dispositions that I've been talking about, psychologists have almost all the methods they might need for measuring these things in schools. We just haven't used them. Uh, but they're totally available to us. And, you know, people love a number, but numbers give a false sense of certainty. And an example is your cholesterol number. I just had to give my cholesterol number. Turns out, 10 years ago, the number was everything. That number told you were you going to live long, were you not going to live long. You had to do something to get that number down. Guess what? It turns out that number is not that meaningful outside of, out of context. That there are all these other factors doctors need to know to know how to interpret that number. So the idea, so these could be turned into numbers. I could tell you all about that. That's fine. That's easy. That's not a big deal. But a number in and of itself just is nothing. It's just a number. Uh, the question is, what's the number measuring, and what does it tell you about the, the thing you're measuring? And these are just some examples of the way in which a school could do a very objective, very rigorous, uh, reliable kind of measurement of what was going on in their school uh, that would not be like the standardized test you're familiar with, but would give us a sense that we knew what kids were getting better at and what they weren't. I'm not a believer that this should or could be used to rank individual children. I don't think that's a good thing to do, honestly. Um, but if I am a believer that uh, measures like this could be used to assess a school, uh, to see if it's doing a good job, and it could be used by teachers, educators, to figure out how they could change what they do uh, to better reach their goals. Um, so I guess I'll end there by saying that I may have touched on many things that you already do in your school, but uh, I may have said them things that pressed on a nerve or stepped on your foot. 
What I'm suggesting to you is that as your children are in middle school and heading towards high school, you not lose sight, even if you don't share my particular goals, you not lose sight of what the important things are you want for your children and the incredibly interesting ways that schools could help your children acquire those dispositions. So thanks.